um, you don't know where your bathrooms are or where the fire exits are in your own house and you're in trouble. For those of you new to Women in Media, we're a bunch of working women uh, who volunteer our time to be change agents for women. We're really passionate about positive reinforcement, equipping, inspiring and empowering women in media. We're a not-for-profit with a board of directors um, funded by generous sponsors like our foundation partner, Bond University, major partner, The Trade Desk, who we'd like to thank for their continuing support and particularly during COVID, they've both been fantastic. I'd also like to thank, you'll see the wonderful Sky Ruggles and Joe Sanders. They're our New South Wales Women in Media uh, Committee members and they're absolute powerhouses and they have brought together this Wimbites initiative when COVID hit and they've been fantastic. And our fabulous Danny Cronin gives us a digital love to make this happen. So we're really grateful for all their work on doing this. It's one of our things to keep everyone equipped, empowered and inspired and in COVID times, you know, we'd love to be meeting in person for champagne and networking events, but instead we've done this. So thanks to Joe and Sky especially for driving this. We really appreciate it. We're lucky to have a bunch of volunteers around the country who give up their time to organise and bring these events to life. So our state conveners, our board members, our committee members all around the country in every state and territory, they're all busy working women um, who actually donate their time to us in the interest of giving back, the generosity of um, giving back. So we're really appreciative. Now, I'm super excited about tonight's session because I think it's something we can all relate to because of COVID basically, but wellbeing. It's probably safe to say in 2020, I think we've all felt, had moments of being stressed, overwhelmed, angsty, um, and there was a burning desire to find some kind of peace or silence or just get away from the chaos. I think that's how day drinking started, but I'm not sure. Um, but particularly with those working from home, we really saw that our, our home spaces and our workspaces became the same space. And I think particularly for women in media where a lot of people in newsrooms, PR, comms, marketing, you know, we have freelancers who are used to working from home, but a vast majority really weren't used to doing that. Um, and obviously it's often easier said than done. Uh, so we've recruited Dr. Libby Sander, who spent years as an academic looking at the evidence-based research around this topic, and Christine Jackman, who has just released a book on this very topic. So we're so excited to have you both. Thank you so much for joining us. They have valuable tips and insights on how the noise in our lives affects mood, sleep, concentration, work, um, and much more. So please add into the group chat. We'll keep an eye on that with any of your questions um, and we'll do a big Q&A at the end. We really wanna talk about what you wanna talk about. And also we have books to give away. Some Christine has generously donated some of her fabulous books. So for some of the best questions, we'll give you some books and those engaged women. We, uh, and thanks Christine and your publisher for doing that. It's very much appreciated. So Dr. Libby Sander is a leading academic from Bonn University, who's an expert on the future of work. She's a leading authority on workplace design and its influence on thinking, emotion and performance. Libby was a speaker at our national conference last year and having done one of our most popular Wimbite sessions, the very first one, we're delighted she's back. And Christine Jack Jackman is no stranger to women in media either and has just released her new book, Turning Down the Noise. Turning Down the Noise follows Christine's journey as she explores the impact of the never ending assault on the senses and attention that is noise. More importantly, she reveals how we can reverse the damage through simple daily acts designed to reclaim silence. Sounds like heaven. The author, freelance writer and communications consultant is an award-winning journalist who worked in New York as a foreign correspondent and the Canberra Press Gallery and has a very, very long bio as does Libby. So I cut it short so we can get to them because they're both incredibly impressive bios to read. So please welcome Dr. Libby Sander and Christine Jackman. That was applause guys, everyone's on mute so you can see it. Um, so look, firstly, Christine, Libby, I guess what I'd like to start with is your own personal, uh, what happened with COVID for you, your, how you've both personally found this year, 2020, um, the highs and lows. I'll go to you first, uh, Libby, because I know, look, as a single parent with two boys working from home, what, what's been your experience this year of COVID and, and what are the highs and lows that you've experienced? I think... Um Initially, uh, it was so strange, wasn't it? And for me, it was a kind of a great highlight because I am really sensitive to noise. So talking about this topic tonight and I like to have time to retreat and just get away from things. And I think most people in here probably can relate to that 
your life is just rushing around so much. And so I loved just being able to be in one place and all of a sudden not having to be rushing around everywhere. That was, you know, really nice. But then on top of that, it was, you know, what's happening with this virus and friends and family and trying to homeschool my kids, which was uh, not such a highlight. Um, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> so hats off to every primary and high school teacher. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. So I think it's just, and it's just this never ending uncertainty, isn't it? We don't know what's happening, uh, you know, and what's happening with our jobs, what's happening with the world. And so it's, you know, it goes highs and lows, doesn't it? I'm at home, I'm on the couch, it's lovely. And then, uh, you know, what's happening is the world going to end. So it's been a real roller coaster, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And Christine, what about you? I mean, it must have been also an imminent book launch, knowing that that's probably been in the works. How have you found the past six months? Yeah, that part was horrible. I um, finished the book, uh, handed the, the final manuscript in on, in February. Um, and the plan was that it was going to be launched at the Byron Writers Festival in August, which is my favourite writers festival for obvious reasons. Um, and then we were going to, we had the basic rollout, which is this pretty standard thing, writers festivals and interviews and, and reader events and things like that, and then go to the UK early next year. And then by the time we were in proofing stage, um, COVID had hit and it was pretty clear that a lot of that wasn't going to happen. And there was a talk of, there was a talk of not putting the book out at all. Would people even be interested in having a book like this? Maybe, you know, they'd have had enough silence at home. Well, that was a crazy thought because most people found that they were living at home with as much noise as they have and more. Um, the really odd thing for me is that I did the reverse to most people. I'd been working at home for about two years, mainly writing the book and um, some other freelance work. And I was approached to go in-house with a hospital that was running a big international COVID research um, program for COVID in ICUs. So not knowing what was going to happen with the economy, not what, knowing what was going to happen with COVID, and of course being a journalist and wanting to be in the centre of whatever story is the biggest story around, um, I thought that was a great idea. So I went in-house and that actually, after two years of pretty much being working at my own pace and, you know, having time for my boys who are teenagers, not commuting, not having to be in an office, um, really messed with my head. Um, really, I found it really challenging to be working back on those office hour type set times with a set commute and being, you know, away from home so much. So I, and at the same time, I didn't want to complain about it because I know a lot of people who are actually losing work. So um, I think the hardest thing for me was that I was wrapping up that contract at the same time as the book was coming out and neither of those things were how I'd planned my life in the second half of this year. But then, yeah, I keep telling myself change is good. <laughs> okay, that's our mantra tonight, everyone. <laughs> yep, if, if Christine's just... Well, it's going to happen anyway, so you may as well yeah. tell yourself that's it's good. Yeah. There's no point reacting or responding, yeah. is there? Um, Libby, back to you, just with, with the work that you've done and like Christine was saying about working from home and then being back in an office, one of the things probably in our industry is it, it's not, um, it would certainly have been something, say, with, you know, whether you're in PR, comms, marketing, but particularly in journalism, to think that a newspaper could be printed from people's homes, that there were no one, there was no one in newsrooms and, you know, editors were at home pressing send and it, it just happened that quickly. So I think a lot of journalists particularly, um, you know, were working from home for the very first time, but that hadn't even envisaged that that could happen unless they were a freelancer. Um, what's your, you know, after years of research and observations and what's your advice for, you know, some women in media in various positions who are still working from home um, or, you know, who may have liked it or not liked it or, or how they now go about, you know, balancing that and if they're going to, you know, could they do it part time if they loved it? or, you know, what those highs and lows of working from home are. Yeah, I think that was one of the industries also where everyone was just like, wow, you know, what's going to happen? And we saw 
radio presenters, you know, with their presenting from their bedroom. And we had, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and, you know, the whole host newspapers being done. And so, you know, I think that was really great in one way because we thought, okay, you, you know, you can actually do this in a different way. But one of the problems with working from home, and especially I think people working in media already have this, is the boundaries of switching off and you know when you are producing your newspaper or tv or radio program from home um how do you actually switch off how do you get off you know your phone and so you know that is a real concern so i think yeah and a lot of people who work in media do enjoy that buzz of being in a newsroom or being in a you know an environment with other people and so they can either love it if they're you know a bit over all of that or they can feel really i'm missing my colleagues i'm missing that kind of contagious excitement around a story or around a project that we're doing so i think yeah, to balance that is, is just having those really hard boundaries to say, okay, I'm going to get off my computer at this time. I'm going to go out of the house. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to, you know, talk to other people in the house or, you know, put my phone down for as long as is possible um, and just really walk away. Because unless we have that discipline, then, you know, um, one thing that's really um, shocked me with my students, I asked them this last week, you know, what's happened for you guys since you had lockdown? And they said, oh, I'm either I'm sleeping much less, um, either much more or much less. And um, quite a few, few of them said, oh, look, I've been spending six hours a day on my phone because I couldn't, I can't go anywhere else. And so I think it kind of creeps up on you. So you've got to have those boundaries to really make sure that you do switch off. And just so on that switching off and burnout, whether people are back in the office or whether they're at home, um, like obviously, you know, putting as well as your academic career, but also the years that you spent in HR, in corporates, what would you see as the first signs of burnout in people? And, and how can either women look for it in themselves, but also for colleagues and people that you're worried about, particularly if you've got friends in Victoria at the moment, what are, what are kind of some of the signs that we can keep an eye out for in ourselves and others? Yeah, I think especially for people who are, I think probably everyone on this call, you know, you're all um, high achieving and probably quite driven people. And so we kind of think, oh, you know, I'm fine. You know, this is the way that we work in this industry. It's high stress. We just kind of go, go, go all of the time. So it can actually just creep up on you. You know, are you feel, how, how are you sleeping? Are you more irritable than you might normally be? You know, are you feeling like you just can't get the motivation to actually get jobs finished or get jobs started you know have you kind of lost interest in doing the things that you would normally enjoy doing at work or interacting sort of coming up with new ideas so i think having conversations with your colleagues as well and kind of checking in on each other um but you know it, it certainly can creep up on us and i think a lot of people are going to be feeling burnout at the moment because they're trying to still do their job and they're worried about their job and they're worried about probably lots of other things. And a lot of the things that we enjoyed, the pleasurable stuff has been taken away from us. So whether it was going to the gym or having coffee or going to a restaurant or traveling. Uh, and so I think yeah, having those conversations and being aware of your own moods as well is really important. And, and so has there been anything in the research you've seen, I know you've been doing a lot around COVID, What's, what have been some of the stuff that, that's come out most recently with, with COVID-related things that, that you've seen? Like I said, I think there was 9% of people kind of switching off news or... Yeah, so people are tending to want to just zone out a lot more from bad news. Um, so I think in Australia it was 9% of, you know, had a decrease in people watching the news because for a while there it was just that every time you turn on the news it was 24-7 COVID and, you know, now it's the, the US election or it's the, you know, second wave in Europe. And so um, people are feeling really quite burnt out. A lot of feel, people are feeling quite, you know, traumatised by what's happened this year. And so, you know, the research is sort of showing that a lot of people are feeling quite stressed, but a lot of them also aren't admitting that they're stressed either. It's like, it's fine, we've got to carry on. We can't show that we're stressed. And why is that? So how can we, you know, how do you actually eke that out of people if we know they're stressed but they're not admitting their stress? Is there anything you can do in a workplace or with, you know, friends in that kind of capacity to tap into that? Yeah, I was having um, a chat with a CEO of a big Australian company about this today and he was actually saying, you know, I'm actually modelling this behaviour 
um, I realized I'm working from home and he's the CEO of one of the big banks. And um, he said, you know, I am going to go outside and post a picture of me getting a coffee outside. And so that my staff go, okay, it's okay to go outside and get a coffee because I would go and get a coffee at work. So I don't literally have to sit at my desk for eight or 10 hours on Zoom meetings um, and to have those conversations. So he started instant messaging his staff just to say, are you okay? You know, I, I know people are feeling pretty stressed. It's okay to say no to this Zoom meeting. It doesn't mean you're going to get sucked in three months time. Um, if we have to make staff cuts, it's not because you said no to this Zoom meeting. So I think being open and honest and letting people know it's okay to say, well, yeah, look, I'm finding this really challenging and you're not going to get a negative consequence for that. Yeah, right. And what about, and I know there's been some research as well around, because I mean, up until a year ago, how many people really were using Zoom like we are now or meetings or whatever, you know, FaceTime, whatever we're doing. It, what's the research that's come out of that? Because, you know, people are just over Zoom, but it sounds as though it's for good reason. <laughs> Yeah, so we just miss, um, when you're in a Zoom meeting, you miss all of the natural ways that we communicate. So you can unconsciously attend to people's body language. You can pick up on the vibe in the room or how did that comment go over that Kath just said? How did other people react to that? Um, you know, how is what I'm saying being received? You know, we unconsciously get most of our communication through that body language. Uh, and we can't see that. Oh, it's really hard to see that on a video conference. So your brain has to work a lot harder. It makes you a lot tighter. Um, and so it's just a lot more effort. It's a lot less natural. You can't have a side conversation when you're in a call like this because that's just a disaster, right? And it's also hard to know when to interject. And so it's just not as natural. So it's a lot less um, enjoyable in some ways. And has it been harder to get balance? Is that what research is finding? Because we are literally living and working out of the same place. And even for those of us where restrictions are, uh, are easing, it's still not the world that we knew and might be for quite a while. So is that where balance is being thrown out for everyone? Yeah, and I think people are starting to recognise that um, now to say, okay, we, you shouldn't book eight hours of back-to-back -back Zoom meetings or even four hours, you know, because in the office, if you have back-to-back -back meetings, you get up, right, and you go somewhere to the meeting. Normally, they're not all in your office, uh, unless you're super famous or important. So, um, you know, and that gives you a physical break. It gives you a mental break. But what we do at home is we sit at our desk and then we get on Zoom and then we get on another Zoom. So we should space those out so that they aren't all jammed together and have less of them you know, use the phone rather than video conference all of the time. Um, and think about, do you really need to actually have a meeting at all? Can you just share a document or do something else? Okay, that's great. Um, look, Christine, on the, on the point of balance, so we'll move over to you. You've said yourself that your life looked successful. Um, you had an executive position, a lovely house, meeting with, meetings with CEOs, phone calls with government ministers, it looked on paper like everything was okay, but you said you didn't feel that way. And I'll quote you here, it said, you felt constantly off balance, your thoughts and internal compass, as well as your ability to care for the people you loved most, were drowned out by the noise in your life. So tell us more about that. And obviously this is how you came to the book, but how long did you have that inner conflict gnawing at you that you knew that it looks great on paper, but something authentically in yourself wasn't adding up? Yeah, I think I'd, it, had, it had been there for a little while, but it got very, very acute pretty quickly when I moved to Sydney. I had a, um, the, the job that I um, took, the executive position involved me moving with the family from Brisbane to Sydney. And very quickly, I was, in fact, even before I made it to Sydney, I was involved in um, uh, helping run our peak bodies, uh, the peak organisation's um, election campaign uh, advertising and so forth for the 2016 election. And that I did from Brisbane because I didn't have a chance to move house. Um, and then we moved. And so by the time I hit Sydney, I was already completely burnt out because election campaigns in whatever, whether you're a journalist or working in a campaign um, room or, or attached in some other way, they're just exhausting, you know, sprints for five to six weeks. Um, so... And then 
I never really recovered from that. And I expect, I was expecting to hit my stride like I normally had when I move overseas, you know, when I worked in um, New York or I moved to Canberra, you just know when you take on that new job that for a little while you're going to feel a bit discombobulated, but then you settle back in. And what I found was um, I had a lot of physical, minor physical symptoms, um, insomnia, uh, constant sort of sin low grade sinus infections and things like that. I just, I remember feeling walking up uh, to my office every morning, like I was wading through treacle. It was just, I, I felt like I was weighted down um, and just tired all the time, but at the same time, unable to sleep because I was always switched on. Um, and I noticed that I was just um, very irritable with, when I came home and the reason that the book is called turning down the noise is that I kept asking myself, like who turned the volume up? Why is it, why does it feel so noisy all the time? And I'd walk in the door at home and I would just be hypersensitive to just, you know, one more question, one more, I've lost my tennis racket. I need this for homework tomorrow. What are we doing on the weekend? And I think that was the other um, alarm bell for me as I started thinking here I am I was a single working mum for you know roughly 10 years um, I'm happily in a relationship my boys are you know relatively happy um, I've got this job living you know pretty much on Sydney Harbour life should be great and yet I'm not enjoying it um, I'm hot probably pretty horrible to be around because I did get to a point where I just almost flinched when somebody would ask me something because it just or almost physically hurt to have one more question or one more ping of the email coming in or text or, you know, those news alerts, all the number of things that have those little ping ding, you know, alarms going off in your life so that you never actually relax. Um, so those were the giveaways. Um, the turning point for me, um, I haven't really spoken and it's not actually in the book, but, um, I was working flat out going between Melbourne, Canberra and Sydney mainly. Now I was in Sydney, uh, Canberra, sorry, Canberra for the federal budget and Mark Colvin, um, the ABC's um, famous host of PM and other things, who was a good friend of um, Peter, my partner and I, he became quite sick and we knew he was, we'd been to see him in hospital. Um, and that, um, that budget, we got the message that he was really very, very ill. And I had to make the decision whether I would actually leave Canberra early to get back. So, which, you know, leaving a federal budget. Yeah. See, so you're not nodding. <laughs> Journos understand that one. It was, it, you, we got through budget. We got through the, the, the morning after for all those interviews, but I thought, no, I'm out of here as soon as I can get out of here. And that felt like a very onerous decision to make and that next morning we made it to the hospital and we were um well there's no other way around it we were with mark the morning that he passed away so we came in to see him and got to say our farewells and as i say in my book my father was getting quite ill at that point as well and i think i rushed in was at mark's you know, in the, in the hospital with a couple of other of Mark's friends and family when he passed away. And then I walked back outside because I knew I had to get back to the office. And I remember having this out of body moment where the sun was still shining, you know, the world was still turning. And yet I'd just lost this person who was a profoundly important person in our lives. And all I knew was to just keep going just keep going, just keep going. And then a couple of weeks after that, my father was diagnosed with, um, well, he'd, he'd had a stroke, but he had an advanced melanoma. Um, and I just remember thinking, and I thank, I thank Mark actually regularly in my head and in my heart, because I don't think I would have known with my dad that I had to make some serious changes or he would be gone. I don't think I would have recognised that amid all the noise of my life if it hadn't been for the way we'd lost Mark because we really, 
it happened so quickly and it was such a shock that I think as a, yeah, I think I, I, when I got the news about dad, I just thought my life is going to keep rolling on and my family, my friends, my, you know, my partner, they're just going to be lost in the, you know, in the jet wash unless I make a decision. Um, and that's where turning down the noise began. Got, okay, uh, look, I'm sorry that, um, of course, for your loss with Mark, and I know there's people on here who knew him as well, and what a fantastic man. Is that yeah, I'm sorry, by the way, to suddenly share that. So, suddenly no, just... no, no, it's, no, because, you know, I think that's really, because, you know, to be honest, and I, and I know another friend on here who had a, a similar, I could see nodding um, quite a lot, who kind of had a similar thing in her family that had, you know, someone who was very close to death, and, and that was a really big, you know, experience for her, and it meant that she moved cities, and, and it really was, it was those, those big moments, um, but had you, so you'd known before that something wasn't quite right, so if it, you know, we're so appreciative of your honesty, it was that defining moment when you walked out, but do you think there was also a temptation, how did you stick to that, because I think, you know, obviously when those big things happen, it can do that. But if you, how long, but much longer would you have gone on if it was just, you know, back on the treadmill, back on the hamster wheel. And like you said, go back to work. That's what you're used to. Yeah. I think that a lot of us, um, it's a hard one to predict how long would I have lasted? I think I was getting, I mean, physically completely burnt out. I was interested to hear what um, Libby was talking about with burnout. I think a lot of us in media, we're, we're trained to ignore the symptoms or at least to not connect the symptoms with our lives because what we're living as women high achieving women is we're constantly told it's great you're doing you're doing fine you know you get more work that means you get a promotion that's all good so the bad symptoms we don't connect in our head to be to being we think it must be something else i did blood tests i had a sleep test i had i had everything Saliva test. The one thing, um, Libby, I can see you nodding. I had the cortisol test, and my cortisol. I I was in sort of adrenal fatigue at this point, which is when you've just run through pretty much all your cortisol, which is the the the, the low grade stress hormone um, that um, you yeah, know we have uh, adrenaline for when we're in big trouble. Yes, um, and cortisol cortisol for when you're just everything stressful all the time at a low grade, you know, you're not about to be eaten or hit by a truck, um, but everything is just finely balanced. And I think that's the life, particularly of working mums, but, you know, but with anyone working in media, because they're working 24 seven on call these days. Um, so I was just completely fatigued. Now what I'm told uh, depends on who you consult. I mean, Conventional medicine will tell you one thing. I had a natu you know, naturopaths tell me other things, but basically, eventually you're going to get something that's going to knock you over. Um, I had such bad insomnia that I'm my I'm sure I was running down my immune system anyway, and I was getting sick all the time. Um, you know, there's research coming out all the time about what you're doing with the inflammation in your body to predispose you then to things like you know, to, to various cancers. But um, so I, I'm sure eventually yeah. something would have, there would have been a big health issue if there wasn't something minor yeah. along the way. So with that epiphany then, where did you go from there? You decided and you, you know, you stuck to, you thought, okay, I'm going to write this book or I'm going to go on this path. And, and then I know that I read that uh, part of your 10 day retreat, I was saying to Libby and Christine, I had about a month ago got to that point and I thought, I'm going to do that. I can't even say it. Is it Vishpana? Vipassana. Vipassana. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Caroline. I knew I, go, I knew Caroline would know. I was kind of, this is where you can't get away with it on Zoom, my fudging. Um, and I thought I could do that. Then I read Christine's story on the 10 days and I thought, I don't know how Kath Weber would go. Caroline's laughing. I can see you imagining that I can't, what, not talk for 10 days. Um, but it's, it sounded amazing. And your, your experience there, can you tell us a bit more about that and your journey to writing the book? Because you've done some incredible research, but you've also put yourself... It, it's through a lot of this stuff as well. Yeah, well, it was research mixed with uh, the personal journey all at the same time. I mean, it was, and I, I, I approached it, I guess, as a journo would in that I thought I just, I don't want to be, if the woo-woo stuff feels good, 
I want to see the science that says it's actually good for a reason. It's actually working. You know, if being quiet, why does being quiet make me feel good? Is there what's going on? Is there a reason in my brain? Is there, you know, and why does noise or what I call the internal digital noise, is that actually doing something that's making me feel bad? And is the reverse, something like Vipassana meditation, going to make me feel good? And if so, why? So I always approached everything with this idea of, I want to experience, but I also then want to look at what the research says. And before I speak about Vipassana particularly, I think we've seen an explosion in the last 10 to 20 years courtesy of things like fMRI, I, I, I can't do it now, fMRI, <laughs> brain scanning, EEG, <laughs> um, ECG. So a whole heap of things, um, new medical technologies have allowed us to uh, look into the brain particularly, but also measure other things, other body reactions that have essentially confirm what for centuries human beings have recognized, which is that this thing called quiet actually feels good. And things like practices around that, like meditations actually do wonderful things for your brain. So it isn't just woo woo. It isn't just monks saying this is good. You know, it'll get you closer to God or something. There is really good evidence starting to build up now about why it's good for us. But before I did that, I thought, well, you know, I had been meditating on and off, um, yeah, for a number of years. I, I did a lot of yoga, so I'd been introduced to med meditation that way. And I had read a couple of interviews. I'd stumbled across various people who said they did this thing called Vipassana and it changed their lives. Um, it's 10 days as you, and it's um, completely, um, it, it's very strict. It's um, in terms of, you, there's no, not just no speaking apart from when you have um, sessions if you want to with the teacher there's a certain times of the day where you can ask am I doing this wrong you know or whatever um, you don't have eye contact with anybody else because they recognize that a lot of our communication comes from not just speaking but through you know facial expressions and eye contact um, there's no um, exercise because they recognize that people will often to get away from you know, what's going on, they'll madly run or you let, they let you walk and they tend to have these retreats in beautiful bushland settings. Um, but, and most of them will have a walking track, but you're not allowed to sort of do yoga. You're not allowed to go for a run, all that sort of thing. Um, and the thing, because all of that I was relatively fine with, the thing that killed me was you're not allowed to read and you're not allowed to write. Um, and that was the thing that, reading even in the small amounts of space that they I had that was free time was free time not a, I, I found it I realized how much um the written word just relaxes me and engaging with words who knew who knew after how many years I've spent as a journalist that right reading and writing should work so well for me but so pretty much from the word go you you go into this what noble silence and um you the men and women are separated although you sit together in a hall and from four in the morning there's a bell you don't have to go into the hall at 4 a.m some places are more strict than others and you work on sessions where they teach you the vipassana technique um which i should say is completely secular it comes from the buddhist one of the oldest pali um teachings in the buddhist canon um the satipatthana sutra, sutra. But there is no, in this, in the Vipassana tradition, as it's taught now, there is no overt proselytizing. So you're not, there's no need to sign up to being a Buddhist or anything like that. They're not there to teach you that. Um, and in fact, um, one of the reasons that Buddhist meditation has been researched so well now is that the Dalai Lama actually um, took a stand a few years ago to say, um, he invited scientific research because the Buddha himself had said, you know, you don't have to believe anything I say, just try it and see if it works for you. So a lot of the research on meditation now has been done on um, monks who've been, who've been invited by the Dalai Lama to submit to this sort of research. Um, and yeah, so for several hours, it's all up to eight to 10 hours a day. Um, in up to two hour blocks before you move, you sit in silence. 
um, and then you get teachings in the evening. But I think the thing that I'd have to say really quickly is that um, what struck me really quickly is that we live in this world of the selfie, of the ego, of, you know, everybody, if, if we're, we're constantly um, curating ourselves online. And there's, you know, there's often the criticism is that we're more ego obsessed and more, you know, self image um, obsessed than ever before in life. Um, so you would think that people would love the idea of if we're so self obsessed, wouldn't you want more time with yourself? Yeah. But it freaks people out. I mean, it really, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, people, when I told people I was going, I was stunned by the hostile reaction I got from people. Um, in what way? What, what, in what? Look, I'm really, I'm still interested myself in, in the why I think if somebody's um, actually quite affronted that you would do this, or, oh, my God, that would just be the worst. It's just the worst thing ever. I couldn't possibly even imagine it. Um, but quite sort of almost aggressive about it. I thought, you know, that I think says a lot about, you know, if you're, if you're that frightened about or that confronted by the idea of sitting with yourself for that long, I don't, I'm not recommending you go and do it, but it should say something about, well, why? I, I, I'm naturally curious why would you be so terrified of sitting with your own thoughts? Now that said, there are many reasons why it's confronting. I'm not saying it's not, yeah. it's, it's yeah. Um, what you quickly realize is your brain will do lots of different things yeah. to distract you and it will come up with lots of fear. It will come up with, there was, you know, at least one girl there who was um, spent the first three days just sobbing on her stool behind me. Um, so a lot of, if, you've, if you're the sort of person who's repressed a lot of things, a lot of that will come up. Right. Um, your body will react. Yeah. You know, you'll get pains and things like that. And, um, and you can just literally, you can, and they're very careful about who they screen to put into these things. You can literally drive, you could drive yourself nuts because it's, yeah. you know. But, so before we, so, and well, so if we take it back from that though, the irony of everyone being so, you know, a lot of people be looking at 10 days and being overwhelmed or even downright kind of rude about your, you doing it. It's yet mindfulness meditation. It's the number one thing kind of going around. We've got apps. We've never had so much access to yoga stuff online, mindfulness meditation. And, and the B I know that, you know, you said meditation for you is literally a lifesaver. So for, could you both give us a, you know, a, some great meditations that you know of or some apps that you recommend or, you know, probably for those who aren't keen on a 10 day course, but you know, what, what does meditation and mind, mindfulness look quite like for you guys in an everyday working life? How do you balance it up? Where do you get it in and how do you keep doing it? It's that, that I think is the key. Well, for me, I think um, the first thing I'd, I'd say, um, and I was very, I wanted to be very clear in the book about this is that um, I don't think anyone should feel like they have to go on a 10 day retreat. Um, I, was really aware because I am a working mum that um, for most people, you just can't fit, you know, a couple of hours of meditation in a day or whatever. You just, you're going, we have to be realistic about this rather than set yourself up for, fail, for failure by saying like we do with the gym or if we're going for a run, it's not just a run, we're going to be running a marathon and so forth. So for me, um, it was fantastic doing a 10 day meditation. It changed my life in terms of, um, the way I can now drop into a meditation. But I also slipped out of a practice while I was working during COVID um, and noticed how irritable I became. So it's, um, it's my, now it's my go-to in the way that say, um, as soon as I notice myself becoming irritable like that, as soon as I notice my sleep getting a bit awry, I will check to see, you know, are you meditating? Are you spending that time on the stool? Now, I've got research in the book that's, that shows that, um, you know, even from about 10 minutes a day, depending on what type of meditation that you do, you start to get feelings of well-being. You start to improve your focus and your attention. Um, the way I say to, say to people now is, with the bulk of research that's coming out, um, if you could do something uh, that 
is free. You don't need Lycra to do it. You don't need to book into classes. You don't need to go anywhere. And the science says that it will improve your well-being, your, Im your immunity, your emotional state, your blood pressure, your sleep. And it's, for, for most people, it has no side effects whatsoever. Wouldn't you do it? Yeah. Well, that's what meditation is and mindfulness. But yes, you're right. There's now an array of different things that you can do. But I see that as a good thing. I do say to people, rather than feel overwhelmed, um, look into the, the big ones. I mean, there's Headspace Calm. I use one called Insight Meditation. Um, most of them will have a paid option. But I, I really emphasize with people, don't feel like you have to spend money. There are some meditation schools that charge big amounts of money. You don't have to, because at its core, it's actually a very simple thing. Um, and at its core, um, you can do a, a practice of, I'd say aim for 20 minutes a day, but even a practice of 10 minutes a day will start to improve um, the way you are. And there are very good on the ones I've listed, very good guided meditations. Um, and I treat, I'd say to people, treat it a bit like, you know, swimming or learning to like, just, you don't dive in and go head first into the deep end. Just try something, try a little bit. Don't put any pressure on yourself. Try five minutes, try a guided meditation, um, and find where you feel most comfortable right. rather than become a purist and make yourself feel like you have to become sort of enlightened overnight. Yeah. If we could have that, that would pop that in a pill. <laughs> exactly. Libby, what about you? I know that meditation's a really big, a big part of your life as well. Have you got any recommendations or how do you, what does meditation look like for you or mindfulness? Yeah, I very much agree with um, everything that Christine said. I worked with a lawyer once who said he was going to go on Vipassana. I have never been. And um, he said by the third day, there was this guy who was like sitting three down from him and he could hear him getting more and more agitated as the kind of sitting went on for hours and hours. And eventually, I think he said it got to about lunchtime and this guy just got up and said, F this, and just ran out of the room and never came back. So I think that's probably what would happen if I went on Vipassana. But um, yeah, I think it, we can do it and find it another reason to beat ourselves up. Oh, you know, I'm going to meditate. This is going to make me all these things that Christine just said. And then we start having these thoughts. Like I haven't done the laundry. I don't know what I'm going to cook for dinner. You know, the monkey mind comes in. And so we beat ourselves up. And so I think to go, well, that's just normal. It's going to happen. Um, even if you've been meditating for years, you know, the Dalai Lama probably says the same thing, right? He has intrusive thoughts come in. He's not just sitting there in this, perfect zen you know space for hours and a day and if you can do five minutes great and build up as christine said um walking can be a great form of meditation and mindfulness as well you know being in nature we know has so many positive effects on our physiology on our stress levels um you know we there's even a thing called forest bathing in japan that's had lots of research studies done on it of immersing yourself in nature so and just do what do what you can if you can just go for a walk or sit for five minutes and listen to a guided meditation um in the morning or night that's great so i just try to do it whenever i get time to be honest and i try to do it in the morning when i wake up but that depends if children have come in or something else has happened yeah <laughs> i would make the observation that um and this is probably blasphemous for every um every religion that all of the leaders um who've who've written about this stuff, you know, who've, who've led um, contemplative traditions. They've, they've been men. Um, some of them have had, you know, have had children, but they've got people looking after the, the, the children. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's why, you know, I've been very committed about saying, as Libby said, you, you find the time that works for you. You know, doing a two hour Vipassana style sit at, first thing in the morning is not going to work if you have small children you've got to get to school it's just not so you know one of the things I've said in the book is um you know I found that I call it the the zone of silence or the cone sorry the cone of silence in the car going to and from work when I was commuting I would turn off the radio I'd stop taking phone calls and I'd stop listening to podcasts because it was a guaranteed period then that I could actually get silence and it or, or at least quiet and it wasn't necessarily a proper meditation because I was driving, 
but just reducing all inputs in that period in that little pod was just it was actually blissful yeah. in in a way and similarly i was I, i've got a chapter on nature and going into nature and about forest ba bathing which is fascinating the research that's been done on just being around trees and i was never a nature person never a hiker um and the difference that i discovered when i went out and deliberately took out the headphones because I think what we do these days, again, we multitask. I'm going for a bushwalk or I'm going for a run. So I have to stick the headphones in and listen to the news, or listen to a podcast and just allowing myself to just be rather than to set it as a goal. So that's what I'd say to busy women. Do it as something that's actually either something that you can have fun with or that you can at least nurture yourself with or be creative with. Don't set it as up for failure. If I don't do this for 20 minutes, you know, I'm a failure. Do it as a, let's see how this feels. If you get to 10 minutes, it's fine. And I should add one thing about meditation. A lot of people think that they're not good at meditation because their brain keeps spitting up thoughts. But that's actually the point, um, as Libby went to um, before. I've had this great analogy with um, weightlifting. Uh, I, 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 monk who was a teacher I knew um, used, which is that when you go to the gym and you lift a weight, you're lifting, say, a bicep curl, you don't judge how you've done by, oh, it wasn't hard. I was just doing, you actually, oops, sorry. <laughs> when you're lifting a weight, it's supposed, you're supposed to strike resistance so that you actually work on that muscle. It's supposed to feel hard. And he said, see, see your thoughts as the weight. And it's not, they're not, they, they're supposed to be there. They're supposed to arise. The exercise that you're trying, you're aiming for, the bicep curl of the mind in a way, is that you're actually training yourself to recognise there's a thought and not get involved in it. So anybody who says to you, you're supposed to clear your mind of all thoughts and you're a big failure if you haven't done that, they're missing the point. It's actually just about allowing the thoughts to be there but not to get um, tangled up in them. And when you do, to bring yourself back to where you are. Um, and, you know, yeah, doing it as a walk, if, if that feels more comfortable or more natural, that can work really well as well, as long as you leave the headphones and the phone itself on, on silent. So you just both touched there on, and we've got some questions, but I just wanted to quickly get your thoughts as well on just with cortisol, like you both, you know, we've talked about cortisol. I know, Libby, you've got a lot of research on it, even on having a fake green plant in your room to calm you down. The research is there, like you said, Christine. But tell us a bit more about the research into cortisol, and particularly around open plant offices. I know you've both got, um, you know, a fair bit of research into this at the moment and knowing that many people do work in open plant offices when we go back or if people are back already. Yeah, so we actually have just finished writing up a study that we did at Bond, uh, myself and two colleagues at Bond, where we created a lab, which isn't often done in research. So we could control everything else that was p potentially going on. And we wanted to explore what are the effects of open plan office noise and distractions like pop-ups on your computer and things pinging at you on your mood and your well-being, And it was actually really fascinating because we measured um, only 59 decibels, which is actually not that much higher than your typical level of noise that people say, this is fine, I can concentrate on this in the office. And um, we only exposed people for 10 minutes, which is quite a short amount of time. So the actual effect um, that we found would It'd be much, much larger. So we measured your galvanic skin response, which is a measure of stress uh, through your skin conductance, um, your heart rate and your heart rate variability. And we found that even with this, you know, fairly short exposure, that heart rate was significantly increased and uh, people's galvanic skin response significantly increased and their negative mood also increased significantly as well. And when you combine those things over time that are going to have a lot of uh, downsides in terms of well-being, productivity and performance. And we don't actually habituate to noise like we think that we do, but your body is still actually taking it in. And so, um, you know, you can say like, as I think journalists I found this often say, I don't feel stressed, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm not stressed at all. And then you measure things like cortisol or these other measures and you find, well, actually they are significantly stressed. But just on that, Libby, is that even more dangerous that if you had someone else that says, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, and, and you measure their cortisol and it's up, 
that that just seems bizarre that journos particularly are sitting there saying I'm not stressed and yet the recent the the study shows yeah you are your cortisol's going through the roof yeah I don't think it's because part of the nature of the industry because you know you say well look I report in war zones I do all these things this is the nature of my job it's constantly stressful I'm you know here's a murder happening over here and I'm doing a camera piece um and so it's sort of like you're expected to not be stressed and you're expected to not be affected by your environment and noise so I think you know that adds then to journalists being either unaware or as you know Christine said ignoring these physical or psychological symptoms of stress and burnout and you know I think you know we need to be really conscious of that because when you're excited you've got this you know the new cycle is adrenaline right it's a constant rush okay and we get addicted to adrenaline and that can lead to adrenal burnout um, and so you need to be really conscious to go okay this is actually giving me this dopamine hit of excitement and it's this surging through my body and actually that's great but you can't sustain that over time you only actually have a very short amount of um, adrenaline each day that's available to you to run away from tigers so you can't just access that 12 hours a day to produce news stories so um, that's something I think to be really conscious of. Actually, just segue into you there, Christine, perfectly, because one of the questions was, how do you recognise when you're stressed in your job and not just addicted to the story? And I think, Libby, you've just touched on it, but as journos, oh, we could see us all nodding, going, oh, yeah, you want to be in the middle of COVID, exactly like you did, Christine. Like, you know, I want to go back into the office and be a part of it. Yeah, so how do you notice... I think the difference is, as I said um, earlier, for me, it was, you become irritable. If you're becoming irritable um, with small things, you've got that, that sort of um, just, you're at the tipping point and all it takes is, oh, the car not starting in the morning or, or one of your kids forgetting that their lunchbox and you're going to have to go back. So you're going to be late you know, to, the, to the office or something like that or your Zoom doesn't work <laughs> and you end up throwing the computer across the, um, the room. Yeah, the, so you've got a low tolerance yeah. for those minor, what are relatively minor infractions. Why? Because you used it all up managing, you know, getting that story in yeah. and those sorts of things. And I think the recognition, I, 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 I say often now, it's recognising that, often you're having a fairly healthy, when you're sick or you're feeling stressed or you're an insomniac or, or, or whatever, rather than see it as you're failing or there's something wrong with you, you know, I've flipped it around now. I say that often, you, you know, ask yourself, am I having a healthy reaction to what is an unhealthy environment? And I say that in terms of not just workplace stress, but I would say that to people who are, you know, in, in potentially abusive relationships or in danger in other ways in that if you're trying to cope with something and your body is saying this is not good you know we've been told not to listen to those signals yeah um, and yet in the meantime we're watching anti-anxiety and antidepressant prescription rates go through the roof we're watching insomnia you know again reported insomnia go through the roof so i i guess what i'm saying is sometimes you have to stand back and say what's What's unhealthy in my life? What's my body trying to adapt to and sending up signals going, excuse me, this isn't really working anymore. Um, lack of sleep, I think, is a really big one for journos because we tend to be feeding more and more information into our brains. And you, what you'll notice is your brain actually needs that sleep to defrag the computer in its, you know, it up here. And if you're noticing that you're not getting quality sleep, it's probably because you're over, you know, your, your memory banks are just over over full and and on that megan had a really good question as well to both of you that she's found you know she was agreeing with you christine but she found she goes into overdrive trying to tick all the boxes of kids and work and personal health care and it's just exhausting so how do you say no to things and and to find the quiet <laughs> it's a person it's a very personal thing and I'm, I'm, I, I mean that really sincerely because i wouldn't want to tell everybody every one of us has a different set of circumstances you know when you're a single mum, you're financially responsible for them. You can't necessarily say, you know what, I'm going to take six months unpaid leave and go and find myself. Um, and I recognise, and I say this in my book, that I come from a position of privilege as well in that I was able to make the decision that I'm stepping away from that big job in Sydney, coming back to Brisbane, 
my partner took uh, yeah found a, a a good job up here while I wrote the book. But so there. But I guess what I'm saying is also is that you have to be prepared to look at what decisions you can make. What can you actually say no to? Because it's going to probably come down to you. I, I used to say this to people in our newsroom all the time. Rupert Murdoch's not going to tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what? You're working too hard for me, making me money. Can you please you know, take some more time off? Nobody will ever say that to you in our industry. It is a 24 seven industry. Um, so you're the one who's going to have to say, what can I say no to? Um, and if it's not work because financially or professionally, you find that it's, it's impossible to, to, to negotiate, then in some cases it has to be, for example, you know, for women, particularly the pressure that's put on women to go out and find an hour in the gym every day so that you can look good or, you know, those sorts of things. I, I really push a lot of the younger women that I know hard on this, that we only have so many hours in the day. And anybody who's telling you that you should be up and then at work with the hair perfect and the face perfect and, you know, ready to go, but you should have done, you know, an hour at the gym and then got the kids to school and done your meditation. They're quite, it's, it's not going to work. You have to say no to something. Um, so I'm not really answering the question because it is very individual. Um, but for me, it's, it, it, it involves starting to do an inventory on my life and saying, um, and, and losing dad actually really helped me clarify those things because it, it, now I approach the, the, the to-do list and say, well, what, what's absolutely essential in the lives of the people I love? What um, will still be there tomorrow? You know, what's not, it's, what, what parts of those to, that to-do list will still be there tomorrow and there's not going to be any, you know, catastrophe if it's still there. Whereas previously I would, you know, I really had my self identity was all tied up and ticking all of those things, you know, perfectly. Um, and I think a lot of women do that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and we found a lot of that in women in media, particularly like ah. there's a good quote the other day that said, it's not about how you spend your time. It's your choices. It's how you spend your choices. It's not time. Yes. Libby, yeah. Livy, what about you? Do you have any advice for how, how do you say no to things? I think, um, yeah, every, everything Christine said is, is super helpful, but um, yeah, finding the quiet, I think, you know, not feeling, yeah, I have to go to gym. I have to go and socialize. I have to do those things because I feel obliged to, I think women, especially, um, are really good, bad at doing that. I'm obliged to do that. I don't want to let people down. But to find what actually does make you feel really good and if, what does carving out quiet look like for you in a way that it would be really enjoyable. Maybe it's with tea and candles and, you know, um, a block of chocolate or, you know, watching your favourite show or you know, actually taking time to have a bath. Like it doesn't have to be these great, you know, enormous things. It can just be small things that allow you to restore. You know, yin yoga, I think we talked about last time, is really great for adrenal burnout and, you know, to calm your nervous system down because a lot of this is that our nervous systems are just so overstimulated and they never get that chance. So to calm them down, we have to do things like sit still and meditate or take a bath or do something that will kind of restore us. So if you think about what makes me feel restored, what kind of makes me feel really happy and how much of that am I building into my life on a daily basis? And that can be small amounts of time, but it adds up to be really meaningful. And I've just seen actually in the chat as well from M said, my quiet time is my visual arts and stitching practice. Snit said, you need to get back into quilting. But Libby, I saw you write back and said things like quilting and visual arts with the tactile element are great. What, why is it the tactile element? What's, what's the research behind that? What, what's yeah, the, what's so the, I think uh, for a lot of high achieving people, but especially for um, people who work in media, um, you know, and academics like this, you're in your head all the time, right? Your job is to be in your head, <laughs> not in your body. And so um, I think getting, doing things that get you out of your head is really important. And that isn't just necessarily sitting on the couch. It's walking in nature or, you know, going and doing a pottery class or, you know, something with your hands. It could be gardening, but something that sort of grounds you and kind of gets that connection back with your body because we do jobs that are really all in our head. That's a great point. I actually was going to, I wanted to add to that because um, I think pushing yourself out of the comfort zone so that you actually have to focus on what you're doing in a way that 
you don't have time to think about stuff up here. Um, for me, because I'm not crafty at all, I'm so not a crafty type of person. <laughs> and I surprised several of my friends recently because I said I wanted to do a, um, there was a, a local florist um, on the north side of Brisbane. They, they were doing nor, um, native flower arranging, but bouquet. Yeah. And I love natives. And it's just the flower arranging is just the, the probably the last thing I would ever do, but it's good coffee next door. And I thought, what? I, I just treated it like, what's the worst thing that can happen? I make a really bad bouquet of flowers and that's an hour <laughs> of my life gone. But what I found is exactly, Libby, what you were describing, which is that for that hour and a bit, I was so absorbed because I had to, I had to be taking in the, the instructions but, and looking at what I was doing. But I was surrounded by lovely smells in a you know, really lovely environment. And it was like a, it was like a, a recharge meditation. It was beautiful. Um, and I was working with something that was visually, you know, attractive. It, we, our pheromones, is it pheromones? Something gets stimulated with you know, the smells of nature. We get all sorts of lovely things that are released. And yeah, I, I, I think that anything that in, involves having to focus enough that you can't be distracted by the thoughts in your head is another type of quiet practice that I'd, you know, really strongly um, encourage people to look at. Great. And we've just got a question from Philippa as well, Christine, which was back on um, after the 10 days, um, you know, you've got this roller coaster of emotions and then we spat out at the end, were you feeling calm and zen? Like what happened at the end? <laughs> it's, it's, I'd love people to read it in the book because it was a, it was a intense period, in, including we got evacuated in silence um, because there was a bushfire. Which is every journo's nightmare, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> Pick up your yeah. phone. What, where? No, it was, it was, you know, and for me, um, I spent, uh, that was day, I think it was day seven or eight. So you do go through lots of ups and downs and you do get the chance to check in. You know, the t there's, there are teachers there and they, are, they do monitor how you're going. So you're not just spat out like go forth and have a nervous breakdown or go forth and be zen. Um, but for me, um, that was a really humbling day because I thought I was really, I was really into it by about day seven. And then we got evacuated and I, we were in a church hall in the middle of nowhere in a on, in 40 degree heat outside. It was air conditioned inside, but you had nowhere to go. And they wouldn't tell us because they didn't know what was happening, whether we would be sleeping the night there or whether we were going back to the retreat or whether the, the retreat would be over. And I spent hours of that retreat plotting in, minute detail how I was going to escape. Um, I, I completely lost the, um, the thread of the meditation intent and got very bound up in my own sort of anger and what Buddhists would call aversion. Um, I decided I was going to run up the road to the Catholic church and throw myself, because I could see a Catholic church in the, in the distance and throw myself at their mercy. And they were going to send me back to Hobart. And I was leaving my partner behind to you know, because he could save himself. Um, but but once we were reinstated and we survived the um, bushfire and went back to the retreat, um, by that stage, I was quite, I think I was quite grounded. I really, um, I actually found coming out of it quite difficult. I didn't want to talk and I'm a talker by trade. <laughs> um, and um, I can say um, that while... I obviously am not meditating at those sorts of chunks of hours anymore. What happens is that you can drop into it. You find that you can drop in much more easily to the point where, um, and this is backed up by research generally, but um, I was a, um, I'm, a, I'm awful at the dentist. My kids are great, but I, I hate the dentist. Um, and I'm, I'm, I got to the point where I had to have gas when I, whenever I was there. Um, and I went to the dentist about a week or two after um, that retreat. And I thought, I'm just going to see what will happen if I just drop into um, the partner encourages you to very, be very attentive to each sensation. So we spend a lot of time trying to suppress bad thoughts and resist and ignore or run away from the bad stuff around us. And the partner treat, treat, uh, trains you to observe that stuff without attachment. And all I can say is I went to the dentist and dropped into that sort of breathing and no gas. I just breathed through it with my meditation technique. And um, it was a complete different, completely different experience. 
um, yeah, it, I, I, that's my, that's my, you know, I, I don't know, my enlightenment moment. I, I didn't get completely enlightened, but I can go to the dentist without gas now. <laughs> okay, where do we sign up? We're all in. <laughs> um, just look, I know I've kept everyone. Look, we just started a little bit late, but there's just one more question I'd love to put to both of you, and particularly because it is relevant to the media industry, whether you're in comms, you know, I know we talk a lot about journalism, but in comms as well, and Christine, you'll appreciate this, how constant it is because you have to be up on all the news and you don't know what's coming and when it's coming and how you respond. So how important is it to take a break from all screens, whether that's reading, social, interacting, since is a fight of some great questions tonight, but I love this. Like, how important is it and how do you, um, how do you actually implement that? I think we spoke about this earlier. I feel like we all know this stuff and we hear a bit of it here and there, but how do you actually do it? Like, how do you stop yourself from having that break from the screen of social media, interacting on social reading to both of you? Give us your wisdom, your best. <laughs> I'm being polite. So Libby, do you want to start or? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's having that discipline to go I, I step back and acknowledge, okay, this is what I do as a job. This is the nature of me wanting to feed into this cycle and get this adrenaline and not feel like I'm missing out, you know, the ultimate FOMO of being a journalist. I missed that story. I missed the, what, what was actually going on. Um, but knowing that, you know, if anyone's already seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix, the new documentary about um, social media and all of these things and what they actually do to our brains and how they keep us um, addicted, literally, um, that should be pretty sobering to watch. And I think just knowing that everything is designed to keep you coming back um, and that it is really important um, mentally and physically to, you know, take a break and just stare into space and be bored and not have this stimulation because it's the constant stimulation that um, drives our nervous system and overstimulates it and then our HPA axis gets thrown out and that's what leads to this eventual adrenal burnout and stress and all of these things that we don't want to have. And Christine? Yeah, I would say firstly, I mean, in any job, whether it's comms or, or journalism, the first thing is to be very clear. We work at a, in a, in a, at a time when our boundaries about work and the rest of our lives have become very porous. That doesn't mean we can't at least try to be more clear about, you know, how many stories are you expected to do? How many, you know, what are the hours of engagement if you're in, you know, corporate comms, apart from emergencies? You know, try and have as much clarity around that for your own sanity as much as to, to keep a check on what your, you know, your workplace is actually trying to get you to do. Um, otherwise it will leak into everything. Um, and then I think it's really important to give yourself not just permission, but to recognize you're doing this as in you're turning off, not just because, Oh, this is a bad thing like chocolate and I have to give it up for a while. You're actually doing something that will boost your, your um, creativity your attention, help your strategic thinking, all of the stuff that actually comes, that creates good quality work. The stuff that comes when you're churning through Twitter um, yeah. and reacting immediately, as we've seen, I mean, we've seen it with Donald Trump, he's demonstrated it. It's poor quality work. It's not the stuff that's gonna win Walkleys. It's not the stuff that's going to be remembered. Um, so when you turn off, recognize, that you're doing it actually to make yourself better, more creative, you know, a clearer thinker um, and all of those things rather than to say, I'm, I'm giving it up because it's a, it's a bad thing. Um, COVID's taught us one thing and I, th I did what everybody probably did, which is when COVID started, I got straight back onto Twitter and got addicted to looking at, you know, what's being said next and what are we going to do and what's happening with, you know, this politician or that politician. And then I realised going into the hospital research space that um, I pulled myself up and realised nothing that we see on Twitter is going to solve this, is going to solve this um, crisis. Nothing we see in the next hour because, or two hours or probably in the next day, science is going to fix this. And science is taking place in laboratories slowly and quietly. And I thought that was a really humbling moment as well. You just, sometimes you need to just step back and say, 
um, actually a lot of this is just noise. Um, the social network, the fellow who uh, Tristan Tristan Harris, who I write about in the book, yeah, he calls it the the race to the bottom of the brainstem to keep you addicted. It's what we're doing on social media is essentially akin to what we're doing with them. Um, if we went to the pokies and we got addicted, it's no more quality than that. So you need to limit yourself. And I use a productivity app when I'm working that shuts down everything. Um, I grayscale my phone when I feel like I need it because you once your phone's in a gray tone, you don't actually want to look at it as much. There's a whole heap of those sorts of, and I'm happy to share more of them, but there's a whole heap of those sorts of things that will you know, re automatically restrict how much time you spend. Um, yeah. Well, good news to everyone who's on here. Um, Sky and Joe have just said, we're actually going to send everyone who's on a copy of Christine's book. So I could feel myself, I think everyone was madly writing down notes and thinking I'm going to buy the book. And so thanks to Christine and her publishers, we're actually going to send you all the books so we can, everyone can actually find those notes in your book and read even more because I have to say this has, and the comments are coming in thick and fast that this is one of the best sessions we've ever had. Thank you, Christine and Libby. One of the most valuable sessions for me that I've attended. You've inspired me to try meditation again. Um, there's so many great, you know, comments in here, as well as, you know, the relief from, you know, learning to say no, experimenting, standing up for myself and putting a high value on me. It felt good, but it takes practice. So love this session. Wonderful. Thank you. First session for someone. It was great. So um, to, to Libby and Christine, thank you so much. That was, I mean, honestly, I know it's me and I can talk for hours as can you, Christine and Libby, we're pretty good too. Um, and I'd love to keep going. I know I've kept everyone over, but thanks so much for your generosity and also for your openness and honesty and warmth and, and for sharing, for, for openly sharing so much. We really, really appreciate it. And 